<laughs> last but not least, as you can tell, there's just so much knowledge and wisdom in the academic space that we're hoping to translate through our conversation. Last but not least, we have uh, Omid Safi. He's a professor of Islamic studies in the Department of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies here at Duke University. He served as the director of the Duke Islamic Studies Center uh, between 2014 and 2019. Ellen uh, McLarney, who opened up this um, gathering, uh, had served as a uh, Duke Islamic Studies director following Omid Safi. Uh, he's written some great books, uh, some of which I'll highlight that, I'm, that are my personal favorites, uh, Progressive Muslims. Uh, it was one of his first anthologies. Um, most recently, a book uh, entitled Radical Love is a collection of Sufi poems. And then also following our memories of Muhammad, Why the Prophet Muhammad Matters uh, is another great book that brings together uh, anecdotes about the Prophet Muhammad. Omid Safi is a mentor of mine, a friend, someone I look up to. He's also the advisor on the larger Alhamdulillah Muslim Futurism uh, project. Uh, and without any further ado, please welcome Professor Omid Safi. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you for showing up on a, on a weekend, and I hope that the conversations that we're going to have are worthy of your time, inshallah. I'll ask you to turn the screen on. There we go. Um, so, before we start with Miss Marvel, this uh, extraordinary new hit from the Marvel Universe, um, beautifully featuring a 16-year-old uh, Pakistani-American of Joyzy background, um, who is Muslim, doesn't happen to be Muslim, is Muslim, uh, I want to actually begin with a quote as a possible uh, segue between the admitted background of a lot of the conversation about Muslim futurism and its antecedents in the black liberation tradition by talking about one of my mentors. Um, we all have people who've loved onto us and it's their wisdom, their love that makes us who we are. In my case, uh, one of my mentors was the late and great Vincent Harding, a uh, close friend of Dr. King's the primary author of Martin's most revolutionary speech, which was the Riverside Church speech. And um, Uncle Vincent, to us, always spoke about the America that we want to live in. And uh, in the aftermath of that dystopian orange nightmare, known as the four years of the Trump presidency, um, and me, we be so blessed that it only remain at four uh, and not be replicated in an orange format or another color format. Um, it was a regular pastime among American Muslims to talk about where would we move to? What country would it be? Would it be Turkey? The food is great, the climate is great. Uh, the politics perhaps leave some questions. Would we move to Morocco, to Malaysia, to Egypt? To And what we kept coming back to is that, no, actually what we want to move to is we want to move to an America that does not yet exist. It's an America that we would actually have to be participants in creating. And that reminds me of the wisdom of Uncle Vincent, where he said that we're offered a sense of vision, of hope, of dream, of a land that does not yet exist. Right? It's not a matter of simply going back to the Founding Fathers or going back to some putative age of the Golden Age, as it were, of Islam, whether that is 9th century Baghdad or 16th century Istanbul, but rather of working together with fellow human beings who are similarly committed to liberation of all at the expense of none. So, into the midst of all of this, in the admittedly bizarre and strange and wonderful world of the Marvel Universe, comes Kamala, not Kamala, Kamala, <laughs> from Joyce. Uh, if you're not already familiar with uh, the world of, of Kamala, Miss Marvel, 
Here's a little one minute preview of what you're in for. Okay, so first off, can we turn the sound up a little? Thank you. I got it. You get what? High school. Kamala. Kamala. Another adventure shirt. Cute. She thinks I'm some kind of weirdo. You were weirdo. Boys. Excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> you're kind of on my show. Sorry. But you're staring out the window in your little fantasy land. Kamala. Hey. Already? Really? Come on, like... Do I have to figure out my whole future before lunch, or is like... Maybe they're right. I spend too much time... in fantasy land. That is not to you. It's not really the brown girls from Jersey City. You save the world. That's the fantasy, too. Do you know what you are? All of this takes place in uh, the context of this nightmare that we have all been through, the um, featuring a president of the United States um, whose knowledge of grammar is so abysmal um, <laughs> as to lead him to say things like, I think Islam hates us, somehow making Islam the subject of a sentence. And for those of us who had to learn English at the age of 15, uh, this offends us to, a, to our deepest inner core because we know that Islam is a system of beliefs and practices, and Islam as such does nothing. It is Muslims, and in fact, there might be many Muslims who hate him, uh, but Islam as such, not, not so much. Um, and the, the uh, paradoxical notion that there should be a complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States, which you know might have been a decent practice had it actually been put in policy at the time of the transatlantic slave trade, where of the 12 and a half million human beings stolen and enslaved, at different points in time, somewhere between 15 and 25 percent of them, according to Sylvia and Diouf, were of Muslim background. In the aftermath of September the 11th, we see the creation of one of the largest departments of the federal government, Department of Homeland Security, um, a an entity whose antecedents goes right back to the civil rights era. Remember that it's Homeland Security's antecedents, COINTELPRO, which kept a file on Malcolm X and it kept a file on Dr. King. Every single phone conversation that Martin had was legally wiretapped. And those same policies initially directed against black population, peace workers, uh, people suspected of being communists, are now in mass inflicted upon Muslim, Arab, and adjacent communities. So in what ways does Ms. Marvel allow us to imagine an alternate world? Well, in this world, and maybe it has to be a science fiction-y type of a world in which we don't just go along with the system and we don't just try to keep our heads low or worse, become accomplices in a deliberately racist and xenophobic and violent system. But rather, Miss Marvel, Kamala, and her friends talk back to the system. And that's part of what we're going to see is Homeland Security in this show titled Damage Control, with all the snark and eye roll that you can kind of imagine. It is a very serious matter. It is in your best interest to cooperate. Serious because your person of interest is enhanced or because she was bought at a mosque, ma'am? Please, return when you have a signed warrant. Excuse me, Miss Agent. Next time, remove your shoes. 
And there's lots of, um, you know, what do you call it? Easter eggs or whatever, a place throughout the show, such as the calligraphy in the background, the same calligraphy that you would see in the Alhambra. No one conquers us except for God. Right, a reminder that homeland security, damage control, the pervasive power of the state to do surveillance on, surveillance on allegedly its own citizens um, will not break us. That we can tap into an inner reservoir of dignity, of grace, of beauty, of music, of poetry, of dance that is unbreakable. So I want us to sort of be shifting forth and back, back and forth between the context of the show and this other real world that we see. Remember that the kind of racism that the Muslim population, just like the African American population, uh, undocumented folks are subjected to, uh, the worst of it is not inflicted by the personal prejudice of individuals. It is systematic, it is structural, it's policy-oriented, it is the work of the state. So we see a situation where the National Security Agency is curtailing civil liberties. Um, if you are at the most mundane level, uh, a, a Muslim who is, this is an actual example, running a Twitter and Instagram account on Rumi with the name Persian Poetics, your funds, your bank account, as an American citizen can be suspended because you've used the phrase Persian. Okay. An entire language can be a code word for a system of evil that has to be restricted. Um, when you see the system of surveillance, NYPD, the very same entity that prior to 9-11 was primarily known nationwide because of the violence that it inflicted upon black and Latino citizens. Understandably, in the aftermath of 9-11, it came to be seen as the great heroic example of having saved people in those terrible towers. And ever since then, in the aftermath of September the 11th, the NYPD begins spying on American citizens who happen to be in the tri-state areas, particularly college students, because we all know that professors can wield this magical wand, which I have one, uh, and indoctrinate people in mass. Would that I had such powers. I can't even get my students to read 20 damn pages per day. But somehow, apparently, I can wave this and they will run out in public yelling, Allahu Akbar, and inflicting uh, terror upon the state. Um, the NYPD was following college students onto falafel joints. This is an actual example, right? Because visiting falafel joints and kebab joints was taken as a sign of radicalization. All politics is local and all politics is personal. The policies that we're speaking of here might get a tiny bit worse under the orange one, and they might get a tiny bit better under Biden and Obama, America's first half Muslim president, but surely not the last. But it doesn't fundamentally change. So remember that how local is it? Duke and UNC, the very same entities to which we owe this conversation, uh, they receive a grant in the amount of $867,000 for professors of communication and media on how to train North Carolina students at UNC to devise anti-radicalization message targeting towards the Muslim community. And guess how many professors who, I don't know, specialize in Islam and Muslim stuff are involved in it. And if your guess is zero, you are the winner of today's lucky contest. So it's in this context that Ms. Marvel is operating, where damage control, homeland security, simply is. And you're trying to imagine being a 16-year-old, slightly chubby Pakistani American with dreams of being a superhero, 
who goes about not living a political life, but to simply be living a life that happens to be politicized by the virtue of you breathing and existing. It's a context in which the FBI has thousands of um, informants, call them spies, placed in mosques, MSAs, and Islamic Study Center, and the vast majority of the arrests that Homeland Security has made are sting operations of those same planted spies spending months and months and months indoctrinating people, getting them to be radical enough to think about committing an action, and then um, swooping down upon them and arresting them under the glare of media lights and proving to the larger populace, this is why you need us. Right? Let's go back to Miss Marvel. So the scene in which uh, Kamala and her friends counter damage control, one of the most extraordinary aspects of it is, yeah, you got the superhero, yeah, she's trying to figure out how to use her powers, but there's a moment in which the people, the community, becomes involved in standing up for themselves and forming a circle around a fallen Kamala. That's extraordinary because the model has shifted from the superhero wearing spandex and a cape, um, somehow coming to the rescue of the people. No one will save us but ourselves. We have to be full participants in the liberation of our own selves, and that shows up in this marvel as well. I want to shift notes a little bit and talk about something that is not oftentimes adequately a part of conversations about Muslim imagination, lives, and the poetry, and indeed love, that lends its fragrance to our everyday lives. Is it not the case that in the teachings of the Chosen One, the Prophet, what we think of as religion or Islam is simply the foundation, and above that comes the level of Iman or faith, incidentally the name of the actress that plays the role of Kamala, but that the highest level of all is Ihsan, which is to make beauty real, to bring love into existence in this extraordinary realm that we inhabit. So beauty and love and loveliness, far from being some kind of a fluff, is actually the very zenith and the goal of Muslim existence. So I want to give you a couple of examples of how love and poetry and this poetic ways of existing show up in Miss Marvel in ways that are truly revolutionary in terms of media, but absolutely every day in terms of lived Muslim lives. So this is um, a story of Kamala's great-grandmother in back then, India, right on the cusp of partition. And we're going to come back to how the partition is a huge part of how Miss Marvel is altering the dynamic of a kind of Muslim futurism or the perpetual gaze towards the past. Touch me and I'll break your leg. <laughs> what? You mean this one? It's okay. I don't use it much anyway. What do you want? Well, for one, I'd like to stop trampling on my poor roses, but uh, from the looks of it, I think you need more help than they do. Can I help you with anything? No. No, thank you. There's uh, food and a place to rest if you need to use my cottage.
So we're not told yet what religion she is, but whatever faith she follows, I would have gladly converted to it just to breathe the same air that she does. And there's something about this sense of Muslim masculinity about Hassan, the great, great grandfather, um, that is refreshingly different from the common portrayals of Muslim men in movies and TV shows. He's not the terrorist, he's not the foaming at the mouth angry monster. Um, he's a poetic, gentle man, very much in love, who, by the way, has um, a, a slight disability. So he limps, he cannot run. There's something about the vulnerability and tenderness of this Muslim man, Hassan, which is, if you've spent time in Muslim societies, completely commonplace. It's men, after all, who tend to be the ones to espouse poetry. But we don't get to see this in our Western imagination so often. This is instead what we're usually treated to. Um, when we're allowed to see Muslim suffering, which is not all that often, um, we get to occasionally see the horrific images of Palestinians burying their children um, as a result of yet another wave of Israeli state aggression. Or, for now, for something completely different, we get to have Muslim Rage, or Muslim Rage Part 2, or Muslim Rage Part 437, by the likes of Bernard Lewis, the very, um, let's be generous and call him scholar, who was invited by George W. Bush and Dick Cheney to the White House to advise them on how to set up the policies of war on terror, or uh, Newsweek. So you can have suffering, or you can have rage, but in Miss Marvel, you get to have poetry and love and romance. The lights are just a tiny bit, but hopefully you can still make out some Now of I know you're just you. putting on a show. No human life can resist the smell of a fresh bright product. So, do you have a name? Or shall I just call you hungry? Perhaps you can tell me where you're from then. So what brings you to my house? I like your roses. Ah, uh -huh. she speaks. You're very kind, but you see, I see you. Aisha. My name is Aisha. Aisha. She who lives, a beautiful man. Hassan. Let me um, move on in the interest of, of time. And I want to leave one more scene with you, which is, you know, we can think about here Audrey, Audrey Lord's notion of um, the uses of erotic. We can think about the idea of how the personal is political. Um, and you can apply many of those same notions, the refusal to separate the personal and the pol political and the erotic and the joyful in this context. What I'm about to show you is just a scene of Kamala's brother, Amr, his wedding. There's nothing about this that would be out of place in any Bollywood film. What is unusual is a scene of Muslim joy on Netflix, Muslim dance, costumes which are through and through Pakistani.
tempting to just stay with that, but I think you get you get the picture. Um, I'm not going to show this uh, clip, and again, in the interest of time, there's a very tender scene with Kamala's father, uh, Yusuf, sitting on the roof of their house, um, sharing a conversation about why she's named Kamala, and he's offering his interpretation of the word Kamala in Urdu, um, and he's the one that suggests the word marvel as a possible translation of it. Um, the notion of a father who is tender <coughs> and not simply the embodiment of a tradition that has to be bypassed and left behind is itself revolutionary in, in this context. And I'm going to end with this um, as, a, as a food for thought. So one of the great backstories of Miss Marvel is the trauma of the partition, the great gift of the English people to much of Asia and Africa at a time in which um, at least my social media feed seems to be split between right down the middle, 99 to 1, and you figure out which one is 99 and which one is 1, between, oh no, the, the queen has died, and <laughs> this is the end of you know, tradition and civility and all oh, things beautiful and dignified and elegant, and then everybody who's got family in Asia, in Africa, in Latin America, in Australia, uh, black and brown people of the world being like, can we also talk about colonialism? Can we talk about this as a queen who was born when the British Empire was really a thing? And that it's during her lifetime that people win their independence, not by being granted it, but by fighting. And oftentimes to have the English, um, I'm working on it cleaning up my language, but leave the ultimate multi-generational FU um, by drawing lines that would ensure bloodshed, um, whether that is in the context of India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, or Palestine, Israel, or an uh, endless number of other factors. What does that have to do with Miss Marvel as being something that is doing something different? She becomes a participant, as you'll see in a 30-second soundbite, of going back in time to the world of partition and rescuing her grandmother. So we're going to watch this. She's going to be wearing a cool little bracelet that has a quote from Rumi, much to my chagrin, not actually from the great Persian poet Rumi, but from the American New Agey appropriation of Rumi. So even if you're doing something radical, it's really almost impossible to escape that white colonial gaze. Um, do better, be better, but still. So we're going to watch this and we're going to end. So this is the last train that unless her grandmother gets on it, she will not make it. And she goes back in time to help her lost grandmother, then a child, in fact, find her way on the train towards what is now Pakistan. Much of the show um, is, it goes back and forth between Joyzy and Karachi. And a Karachi that is not about drones, and today not about floods, but a celebration of a beautiful, vibrant, colorful life. So, Let's end with a simple um, reflection. How is this getting us beyond the thought of progress or trickle-down Islam? The idea of progress in many ways is the 19th century invention and the arrogance of Western Euro-American modernity that the whole of humanity has been evolving towards Western civilization. Time and again, Muslims, particularly in a traumatized context, we have had to conform to this by assuring a white dominant audience that we gave you chemistry and we gave you mathematics, not realizing that people hate math and hate uh, chemistry anyway, so this is not really endearing anyone to us. If we really wanted to win people over, we would tell them we gave you coffee and coffee shops because what you know as cafe culture, that's us. Like, you know, um, so many people have tried to play this catch-up game 
of we want to be part of your master narrative. Taking that same narrative and flipping it, there's tended to also be a Muslim response to it, which is the golden age paradigm. The idea that the best of generations was a time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and then the next one, the generation after that, and after that, and after that, maybe 9th century Baghdad, uh, and then it's been a thousand years of decline ever since then. So we're caught between these two master narratives, that humanity has been evolving towards Western white people, or it's been declining from the great Muslim past. Miss Marvel is part of a generation of Muslim artists, Muslim dreamers, hopefuls, for whom history is neither a trickle down nor a train up, but simply an existent here and now, wherever we find ourselves, not where we happen to be Pakistani and happen to be Muslim, but because that our particularity is not an accident, nor is it something added to some kind of a notion of a universal humanity that is really just vanilla. But that the songs of our ancestors, the dream of our grandparents, added to our own dream, added to our own voice, added to our own courage, is part of what will ultimately save us and redeem us, and perhaps in the process, also redeem us beyond the confines of time and space. Thank you for your time.